thank you very much, Bill. That was one of the more intriguing uh, introductions I've, I've had to the director of Irish. Um, I had actually completely forgotten about that little chapter. It was actually the Seattle Times and the Post of Politics. But I actually forgot. I got a call at uh, 5 in the morning asking me for a comment on the fact that they decided to do this. And I, of course, thought that they were tilting against the and that there was no that was a very exciting thing and also an example of how one person can make a difference because it actually was a commitment of a publisher who basically just got one over and listened when we described the harm that his new people were doing. And I think you all are in a very similar situation right now, uh, although we're further along due to the incredible work that's been done uh, so far. But, but in many ways, even if you went back a few years, the, the thought that there would be a conference like this, uh, this energized, that there would be as, as much positive moving forward uh, would have been almost anything. So I'm, I'm also thrilled. I, I was glad that I get to go. Uh, in some ways, I'm glad to go after it. Some ways, nervous after Dr. Williams and Dr. Schroeder, because they did such a great job of laying out the clinical issues uh, related to mental health substance abuse and smoking, but also the kind of policy and systems environment. So I'm going to try to focus less, a whole lot less on that, and more just try to tell you um, a little bit about uh, what CDC is doing and why we're doing it. And I'm not going to do that so much in a self-serving CDC way, but more because I think it's important for you to realize that the things that are being talked about and suggested for doing this really have reached the big league in the sense that, that many, most of the national, federal organizations that are involved in trying to work with smoking and also the ones that are involved uh, in substance abuse and mental health at SAMHSA are, are fully on board and aggressively looking at what we can actually do now to support your efforts. Uh, I, I did just want to underscore two things that, that they had said earlier because I think those are key. Um, one is essentially that there's no evidence uh, that addressing smoking in a mental health or substance abuse environment is going to do harm and, and actually if anything suggested evidence that it will actually improve treatment. And, and that's incredibly important because that's served as kind of a boogeyman to keep this from happening. As it did 20 years ago in primary care and specialty medicine, that we shouldn't do this because it's an imposition on smokers. The other one is that we are clearly seeing increased efforts to integrate uh, smoking, uh, and address in smoking uh, across the various environments in mental health and substance abuse treatment. And there's every reason to believe from our prior experience and what we're seeing now that this, this can be really gloriously uh, effect, uh, effective over, the, over a short period of time. So this is um, three quarters of CDC's goals. Our, our mission is world free from tobacco and death and disease. Uh, there may be different ways to get there, but we're confident that we actually can get there. But this is an, an eminently achievable goal. Uh, our, the three goals listed here, initiation, promote initiation, promote cessation, and smoke exposure. But the fourth one is very, very important to me and to us, which is to identify and eliminate tobacco-related disparities. And um, I'm going to start, and just I'm going to run through those two. I'm going to start with identifying. And a, a number of years ago, maybe four or five years ago, we began looking seriously, they're kind of trying to do a refresh on our approach to disparities, to health equity, to social justice around the different groups in the country that are afflicted. Uh, particularly disproportionately afflicted uh, by tobacco use, especially smoking, and to try to sort of take the blinders off and say what, what, what's really driving the persistence of smoking in our society and are we doing enough about this? And there are lots of challenges around identification because almost by definition, groups that have not been previously addressed are not identified. We don't ask questions about them. In, in our routine uh, surveillance instruments to try to check track what's going on with, with smoking and tobacco use. And then there are a whole series of issues around how we should then classify uh, 
people uh, as we're trying to collect this information. And, and many of those have proven to be true with mental health and substance abuse. Do we add a few questions that just ask people to self-identify? Have you ever been diagnosed with a, uh, a, a have you ever had a diagnosis of depression or anxiety, uh, et cetera, a mental health diagnosis? Or, because we know that will be severely underreported, do we, do we actually try to do a little inventory of the of behavioral uh, uh, symptomatologic uh, report? And we, we've tried both of these. And lo and behold, um, I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about what, we, what we, we found, but I think that's already been covered. So the other thing I want to do is talk a little bit about the role that, that we play in an analogy, a quick analogy, which is a, a group that suffered from similar kind of uh, blinders along from uh, the tobacco control uh, movement, which was the LGBT community. And smoking behavior in this population was most definitely not routinely available up until a few years ago. And it got to be routinely available because people worked very hard and essentially demanded that it be available. Uh, one example of how one, uh, one of our networks, both, the, both our LGBT network and our uh, Hispanic Latino network worked together, uh, a theme which I'm going to come back to, to uh, identify several different opportunities. Uh, one was actually a regional one in Puerto Rico, where a pride advocacy group there work with our National Latino Tobacco Network and a network for LGBT tobacco control to collect data uh, at a, a Pride Festival simply to demonstrate to the to the policymakers that the that the prevalence of smoking in this community was very, very high. But that group also did very hard yeoman's work, really working to get the people at the National Center for Health Statistics and other groups that were running federal and state surveys to, to add um, to add questions. And all the same, many of the same kind of quote unquote excuses that were made for that group have also been made around adding mental health substances. Well, I'm sure this is too long. Well, it's going to be very people if we ask them these questions, uh, which again has been used for both groups. And the bottom line is that we have, we've just powered ahead and added these questions, and lo and behold, have determined that it's very good that we ask these questions because there's something very serious and important going on. And then the, the other thing that we did about identification was last year we published, we published what the CDC calls a vital signs report. We do about one of these a month, or not quite a bit, one a month. And we tried to do one about every 18 months, 12 to 18 months in, in tobacco, for areas that are particularly important from CDC's perspective for, for the health of the population. Uh, so these are a big deal. And last February, the one that came out was on adult smoking, focusing on people with mental illness, and, uh, the entire uh, the entire vital signs report. And, and I'm, I'm going to focus on, on mental illness because that's mainly what we focused on in terms of identification. But I want to be clear that we also recognize that substance that substance abuse is is at least as important, it's very, very important, and also needs, needs attention. So in this vital signs, I'm just a couple of things that you've you already heard most of this, but it was important this be done in the format of a vital sign by CDC. That more than one in three uh, adults that have mental illness smoke cigarettes compared to about one in five uh, adults with no mental illness. That three in ten cigarettes are smoked by people with mental illness. It's at least four in ten you know, with substance abuse. Uh, and that one in five adults have some kind of mental illness. So this was all very, very important because part of what we're lobbying for is really it's to win the hearts and minds of the tobacco control groups, all the people in the, in the state, health departments, et cetera, plus other federal agencies, so that this is real and important work that we have to do. And just a couple other things that this report showed, and this I think is also very important to keep in mind generically, which was the relationship of mental illness and smoking by poverty level. And in this we see that about a third of people who report having any mental illness uh, smoke. But if you're below the poverty level and you have any mental illness, almost half smoke. And this is, has been true, has proven to be true in virtually every other subpopulation that we've been looking at over the last uh, uh, last decade. That there is a, an across-the-board issue relating to poverty, both both uh, economics, but also particularly uh, your your level of education. 
So I actually think that's an important thing that we need to keep in mind even as we're working with people with, with um, uh, mental illness to integrate tobacco, is that there are also unique vulnerabilities probably related uh, to the uh, socioeconomic status. Now there were also some things that we discovered that we were somewhat surprised at. Now, I, and actually I'm going to confess that this first bullet here is not, is not exactly precisely accurate. Uh, it said prevalence slowly in the Asians uh, with mental illness smoking the highest for whites. It's actually the highest for any, any guesses of racial ethnic group? American Indians, correct. American Indians who have a, 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 any mental illness have a rate of 55% smoking, whereas whites come in at about 38 to 40%. Now, the, the one interesting thing is if you actually look at the eth racial ethnic group that have the lowest prevalence, Asian, Asian Pacific Island American, Americans, um, if, if you are an Asian Pacific Islander and you have mental illness, you have the highest discrepancy between other people in your, in, in, in your race ethnic class. You're two times more likely if you're, uh, if, if you're an Asian Pacific Islander to smoke. And if you are an Asian Pacific Islander woman, you are three times more likely to smoke than your other Asian Pacific Islander women if you have, um, if, if you have a mental illness. So even in the group, you might say, hey, well, they would, you know, why should we even think about them? Mental illness is, is an absolute critical differentiator around how, what to think about. And this just illustrates the, the other thing that really woke us up to why we had to do something about this. Because unlike the general population, which over the last almost 20 years has shown an almost continuous decline, that's the lower line that goes from 24% to 18%, uh, people without serious psychological distress, um, this, we, we've basically seen a flat line over that same period uh, for people with, um, with serious mental illness. Now, again, again, I think this has been gone over a little bit. You're going to hear more about this, so I won't belabor it. But there, there are plenty of reasons why this is probably happening, some of which we're more certain about than others. Uh, the, the Vital Science Report uh, essentially called some of these out, and that one was uh, fairly obvious both the mood-altering effects of nicotine as well as the issues that make it challenge to quit if you have a mental illness. So uh, just to give one example, uh, people who have a panic disorder are much, a much harder time quitting than one of thoughts is that this is because the symptomatology of withdrawal is very similar to the, to the kind of symptomatology that you get when you're starting to have a panic attack. Uh, so there are many types of things related to that that may make it harder for people to quit, may, may make them more susceptible to, to getting hooked as, as an adolescent. All these things make it so that we really have to think more specifically about this population. Um, and then another issue is whether there's an actual increased lack of knowledge about health effects uh, within this population, some of which has been imposed by, as was noted earlier, the less um, meticulous attention to imparting the, the, the dangers of smoking to people with mental illness than we've perhaps done over the last 20 years in, in other parts of medicine. And then finally, but very important, is that we, there is evidence from the back industry documents that people have been specifically targeted uh, for the, the, who, who have mental illness. In terms of elimination, there's a series of things which we shouldn't forget, which are things that actually, as far as we know, seem to work for all, virtually all human beings. And what we're mostly trying to do from a disparities health equity perspective on these is to make sure that they're being evenly applied and that there, there's not some idiosyncratic to the price, uh, sensitivity to price, uh, 100% smoke-free policies, targeted media campaigns, straightforward, uh, reliable access and public uh, <coughs> promotion of uh, the kind of uh, cessation support that was, uh, that, that's been, that's been uh, thrown out. And then finally, regulation, which we don't know as much about as we hopefully will in the next few years, but, but this is another area where uh, they, they will, there will be special attention paid over the next decade to some of the things, for instance, that FDA may do, like nicotine reduction, and how that may impact uh, people with mental illness and substance use disorders. 
Now, I did want to just take, go from the general now to the specific. I've got, this is the executive summary of the 2014 Surgeon General Support, which is actually a thousand page document, but I didn't want to bring that up from Atlanta today. Um, but this had several findings in it that were specific to uh, mental health and substance abuse populations that are worthy of note. Um, and worthy of note again because this is a, a sign of the mainstreaming of, of this as a critically important issue. Uh, this is, so this is, a, this is a high level, one of ten conclusions of this entire thousand page document was that the evidence is sufficient to conclude tobacco cessation treatments are effective across a wide population of smokers, including those with significant mental and physical comorbidity. Research indicates that smoking cessation interventions with individuals experiencing mental or substance abuse disorders are feasible, beneficial, and needed. Smokers with mental illness can quit and remain absent from cigarettes during mental health treatment, and that, and that this is a promising setting, a promising setting to promote smoking cessation. Now, I'm just going to talk about two, two challenges about how we're doing this. I'm not going to dwell on these, but I just want to mention these because particularly, these have been challenges that every single group that has come to the table around their, their subpopulation and how it interacts with smoking has had to wrestle with. And the first is kind of a, a pendulum uh, effect, particularly when um, people, a group has not had any attention and not been identified. Uh, it, 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 it may have a tendency to swing back and forth between two areas. One, one is, hey, you know what? We got all these things that work. The problem is just that we need to disseminate them, make sure the group is getting them. We have to integrate this into everything else that we're doing in, in the way that we approach this group and the way that we approach uh, tobacco treatment in general. And the other, the other one is, hey, we've got to carve this out because our group is special. And most people are right when they say that, that there, is, there are special things about the group. It's probably more true with, this, with, with mental health and substance abuse than for others. But uh, we have to carve it out, and we have to create an entire new set of um, services that will work for, for my population, because my population is different. And, and then sometimes people will also come to some other area where they'll say, well, we need to tailor these these treatments to people, but we don't have to create entirely new ones. I'm not suggesting actually that I, I think actually in some ways both of these are potentially true, and it's our job to figure out which which one needs to be done the most or that we're in the best position to do. The second challenge is just this is a, this is a fuzzy diagram of just the complexities of what most people are. Most people are not just hey, how, how do you do? I'm I'm anxiety disorder, or how do you do? I smoke marijuana, or how do you do, I'm low SES. Most people are a constellation of, of different factors that, that interact with each other. And, and so it's very important as we're doing work on one, on, on one particular group, which is very important to also keep in mind how it's interrelating with, with other factors that overlap with each other. Now just a couple things about what CDC is up to, I'm not going to dwell on these, but in addition to the work that I'm going to tell you a little more about in terms of the networks, the other thing that we've done is, is we're working to try to essentially make sure that the federal government is addressing smoking with and mental illness with uh, the level of, of seriousness that it, that it deserves. We've had great partners, particularly with SAMHSA, doing this. Um, but just a couple examples. In the in Healthy People 2020 objectives, which uh, are something that actually does drive uh, priorities in, in the federal government, uh, has a, a focus on clean indoor air and making sure that there's equity, uh, for instance, in mental health treatment facilities around this, that their screening and counseling are made available at the same high rates that they are in, in primary care. The, health, the HHS strategic plan on tobacco focuses also on areas that people may essentially be discriminated against around some of these, such as public housing uh, and the development of research and surveillance around tobacco and mental health uh, populations. We're also involved in doing specific research, uh, for instance, around quit lines. This was mentioned earlier this morning. 
uh, about trying to really make sure that people, A, are getting services, and B, that those services do, do actually seem to work uh, in a similar fashion. And we're also looking at the, the programs. There have been a series of programs that have been done at local levels uh, through the CPPW program that was mentioned earlier. And we're actually trying to look at evaluating these to ensure, hey, which ones work, which ones didn't work. And then we're very excited about these initiatives that, that states are, are doing, have done under, under these auspices. Uh, the work that North Carolina's been doing has been mentioned, but we've also seen great work done in New York about Medicaid expansion, in Delaware about the addition of mental health questions to in intakes and their pipelines, and in Arkansas, which has a uh, state law now prohibiting use of tobacco products on uh, in psychiatric facilities. So now I'm just going to spend a few moments talking about uh, the national networks that we, that we run. I've mentioned two of them are um, the, the networks that we, that we have for uh, LGBT and the ones for Latino and Hispanics that have been very active. But we now have eight specific networks. And two of these are new. Uh, one of the new ones is actually on geographic uh, disparities, because in our country, mapping with some of these other things in the South and Southeast, we have a threefold disparity between you, if you're born in certain states in the South. East compared to if you're born in some Western states. But the, the one that's obviously the most important of interest here is the National Council for Behavioral Health and the work on, uh, on mental health. And so we set this up because after we did the identification work and we looked at what we've been doing around elimination, we said, hey, it doesn't make sense for us to be doing all this stuff with essentially mostly racial and ethnic and health. SES, when our numbers indicate to us that there's a huge gap between what we're doing and the size of the problem in the mental health and substance abuse community. So, we are working with the National Council for Behavioral Health, which is providing the administrative leadership for the National Behavioral Health Network for Tobacco and Cancer Control, which also includes the Smoking Cessation Leadership Center. Which, by the way, I have to do a shout out to my colleague Steve Schroeder, who um, was incredibly inspirational to me and taught me a lot about the importance of this uh, before I went to CDC and since. And the Behavioral Health and Wellness Program at Centerstone Research Institute. So these groups are working together to do what our, we task our networks to do, and a lot of which they're doing, which is to um, interact with our states and provide technical assistance support to the states, but also provide support for other uh, national and regional organizations that are working on this issue. Recruiting, empowering, preparing stakeholders across public health, behavioral health, primary care, and education to prevent and reduce tobacco use and cancer among adults with mental illness and substance abuse disorders. Um, and you're going to hear a lot more from them, so I won't go on. I'm just going to close with a, a shout out for one thing that I think it's interesting to think about, about why, why it's important to have this kind of work. Uh, I, I think Steve alluded to the TIPS campaign that we've done, which has been an incredible experience over the last three years. Uh, for the first time, the federal government has been running a 40 to $50 million national campaign uh, around the harms of, of tobacco. And uh, we, one of the things that I think has made the campaign more effective is that we've worked with our networks to make sure that as we are running a general population campaign, which this has to be because it's a national purchase, we are being very, very attentive to the needs and the opportunities associated with um, populations where we have health, there are health equity concerns. And uh, I say this because there is some possibility we, we would like to do something similar to what we've done with our other network populations. We'd like to do something similar in 2016 with mental health and substance abuse populations. This would be very challenging and require a lot of help to figure out how to do that and then to execute on it. And then to do the other thing we should do, which is to take advantage of this, to take advantage of it so we can actually move your work forward. The fact that there might be a national campaign, there might be resources, that there might be real people with mental health and substance abuse disorders who had stepped forward and told their story about how smoking it would have had impact on them that would be available uh, to help move 
to work forward. This is just an example of what we've done around, uh, around Spanish Hispanic, how uh, the network, uh, our, our, our Hispanic network had uh, done, helped, helped to, to get greater traction through earned media around this. So it's a CNN uh, interview uh, about the TIPS campaign. They also work with the ad development very, very closely, and they also work with ad placement to make sure that we weren't just developing ads and then running the general population, but how we could use those ads by, by placing them in media that were specifically used by their target population. So I'm just going to close by saying that we identified, we went through this process, we forced ourselves to work with our partners to identify the fact that there was a disparity health equity and the social justice issue associated with mental health and substance abuse and tobacco. And we've begun working, and I, hit, and I focus on the word begun, we've begun working trying to figure out what role we can play to support the work that all of you and others are doing to try to correct this. And this is correctable. I don't think there's anything that makes this something that has to be that five, ten years from now the numbers need to look exactly the same. We should be able to bring this down. We've been able to do that with many, many other groups in this country. There's no reason that we can't do that this, and clearly it's incredibly important. Uh, so therefore, I'm excited to contribute to this effort and have uh, CDC uh, do it by supporting the National Council for Behavioral Health. And with that, I'm now going to turn over to my colleague, Shalina and Laura, and let you guys tell us even more about what we're planning to do and do it. Thank you. Hi, um, my name is Lara Roth. I am the Senior Policy Associate at the National Council for Behavioral Health, and I also serve as the Program Manager for the National Behavioral Health Network for Tobacco and Cancer Control. Um, and I want to say, you know, thank you, Dr. McAfee, for your comments. Um, I think, you know, you bring up such a great point that this really is a social justice uh, issue and a public health crisis that we're seeing among the behavioral health population. Um, the slide that you brought up earlier showing the, the rates of people with mental illness and substance use disorders, their rates of tobacco use, and then the general population, I think uh, brings up a really interesting point. Um, and I'm, I'm going to call you out, Doug, Doug Tipperman from SAMHSA um, at, a meeting that, <laughs> at a meeting that we had a couple weeks ago um, in collaboration or in part of our uh, annual conference, National Council's conference, brought up a really great point that you know, we know that this, we see that disparity, and I think that graph started in 1997, and you see the disparity between the general population and people with uh, a serious mental illness or substance use disorder. And as the rates of the general population go down, we're seeing an increase in the disparity between those two populations. Um, and when Doug brought up that up in our meeting, I thought, you know, that's a really great point. Um, and so we are so excited to be partnering with the CDC, um, and the other consortium of national networks um, in these efforts. But what I'm going to do right now, actually, is provide a little bit of background information about the National Council for Behavioral Health, give you a sense of who we are, um, who our members are, who we represent, and then also kind of how we got into the field of tobacco control and prevention. So the National Council, we are a membership association, and we represent a little over 2,100 organizations across the country in all 50 states that collectively serve about 8 million children, families, and adults that have serious mental illness and substance use disorders. And of those 2,100 member organizations, we estimate that um, we, collectively they represent uh, about a little over a quarter of a million uh, behavioral health professionals. And really, our members run the gamut in terms of the types of organizations that they represent. So while the majority of our members are community-based mental health and addiction treatment providers, we also have quite a, a number of other types of organizations. Um, where there are some hospitals that are members of ours. Um, we have some state and local governments. We have a few managed care organizations and some federally qualified health centers as well. And really, our role at the National Council, the role that we see, is to provide our members with technical assistance, support, and consultation to help them deliver the best care that they can, to ultimately help individuals with a mental illness or substance use disorder live healthy, productive lives. And I would be amiss not to mention another program that we run out of the National Council called Mental Health First Aid. 
And this is a public education and awareness program um, that very much like regular first aid, like you might think of regular first aid, the mental health first aid training uh, curriculum is designed to help the average individual recognize, understand, and respond to somebody who might be in a state of crisis as it relates to a mental illness or substance use disorders. And uh, to date, well actually, I take that back, I think by the end of 2014, we will have trained 200,000 individuals across the country in mental health first aid. Um, we have our original training curricula, which I believe is uh, eight to 12 hours. Um, and we also have one that is specifically designed for youth. Um, it's designed for those who work with youth, specifically so school-based settings. Um, we also just released um, a new training that is specifically designed for veterans and their family members. And we're also working on one that is going to be, uh, it's a training that will be in Spanish or delivered in Spanish. So our president and CEO, Linda Rosenberg, often refers to our member organizations as community problem solvers. And, and I really like that term because I think it's a great description of the broad array of services and support that our members provide. So in addition to the traditional types of services that you would think about um, in patient, outpatient settings, et cetera, um, quite a number of our members also support, provide supportive housing, supported employment, um, jail diversion programs, that sort of thing really to help their clients be active members within their communities. Um, and so when you look across the types of members that we have, I think that's really kind of a great representation. And when thinking about community problem solvers, um, I think it would be uh, wrong to not talk about this in the context of sort of whole health and wellness um, in general for this population. And so really one of the things that the National Council has been doing over the past 10 years or so is thinking um, about you know, the integration of primary care and behavioral health. It's something that we've been doing for a while. I'll touch in a moment on just a few of those um, activities. But I think this is really kind of a key part to the work that we do, and especially the work that our members do as well. And I think the work that we've done in this area has really led us to our tobacco control and prevention efforts. Um, and I'm sure as many of you know, uh, a number of years ago, there was the statistic that came out that people with a mental illness or substance use disorder are dying at the average age of 53, or about 25 years younger than the general population. Um, and this is an astounding statistic. And we know that the reason, the primary reason why these people are dying at an earlier age is because of chronic illnesses like cardiovascular disease, pulmonary disease, hypertension, diabetes, etc., because of risk factors like obesity, tobacco, etc. And so when we started our work around primary care and behavioral health integration, we knew that we really did need to focus and that tobacco needed to be a key component of the work that we've been doing. So, you know, the National Council is very much committed to practice improvement and workforce development and capacity building. And so, you know, through these efforts, um, we have been focusing a lot, again, on primary care and behavioral health and I think one of the things that's been really exciting for us is that while we've been focusing on tobacco control and prevention in a variety of ways, um, over the past year, when we have developed this new partnership with the CDC, it has given us the opportunity to take it one step further. And it has really been our foray into the public health field, a field that we haven't necessarily been um, integrated with or interacted with in the past. And so up on the screen here, I have just a few examples of some of the work that we've been doing around primary care um, and behavioral health integration. Um, we run a number of learning communities and collaboratives. I think over the past seven years, we've engaged over 300 organizations, um, other member organizations, on uh, different programs that are targeted to improve, uh, targeted improving the health outcomes of the clients that they serve, primarily through integrated treatment. So integrated of integrated treatment of primary care and behavioral health, um, also substance use um, addiction treatment and primary care specifically, as well as the integration of mental health and substance use treatment. Um, and then about five, about four years ago, we received a cooperative agreement from, uh, the, from SAMHSA and HRSA um, called the Center for Integrated Health Solutions. And this is a technical assistance center run by the National Council that provides training and technical assistance for 
for about 100 grantees, SAMHSA grantees across the country, helping them to integrate their services and partner with their local federally qualified health centers. And so what's really been unique about this is that we've had an opportunity to tap into a variety of different models of integration that are happening across the country in different states, different scenarios, et cetera. And as part of this grant, we are focusing on tobacco control and prevention efforts within these grantees. Um, Jill Williams actually is about to wrap up a webinar series with our grantees on tobacco cessation. Uh, Chad Morris and his group at the Paper Health and Wellness Program have done trainings at the uh, regional grantee meetings. And so we really see this as um, an important component. But as we were just talking about earlier, I think we need to take it one step further. And so that's one of the reasons we're really excited about the work that we're doing with the CDC. Um, we already talked briefly about the National Behavioral Health uh, Network, and Shalina, my colleague, will be speaking about that momentarily. But I did just want to touch on one other uh, smaller grant that we have with the CDC um, through the Office for State, I'm going to get the acronym wrong. Um, it's the Office for State, Tribal, Local, and Territorial Support, or OSTILS. And um, the, the project that we're working on, we have done a kind of an environmental scan of state tobacco strategic plans to assess the degree to which they identify um, the behavioral health population as a target population for their state and local efforts. And the product of this project will be a white paper um, that we anticipate uh, might be released later on this year that has a set of recommendations for state tobacco control programs, uh, state mental health authorities, community providers, and other key stakeholders to really um, assess uh, what are some steps that they can take, what are the conversations that they need to have, um, what are maybe some best practices that are already happening in states around the country to really focus efforts, at, again, at the state level and the local level to focus on addressing the disparities that we're seeing with this population. Um, so we're really excited about that uh, relationship and partnership that we have with them about the release of the paper as well. Um, but again, I think, you know, overall, this is something the National Council is very committed to, we're very excited about. Um, it's been wonderful for us to connect with our member organizations and see some of the work that they're doing. There really is some great work out there, as I know you've seen from the presentations from this conference and that we'll learn about later on today and tomorrow as well. Um, and so we're really excited to capitalize on those best practices, um, and Shalene and I are both very excited to learn from you all as we're here. So at that point, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Shalina to talk more about the National Behavioral Health Network. Thanks, Lara. Hi, uh, my name is Shalina Botteringham. I'm the Director of Practice Improvement at the National Council and also serve as the Project Director for the National Behavioral Health Network for Tobacco and Cancer Control. Um, and I'll just take a few minutes just to tell you a little bit more about this new initiative. Um, it's called the National Behavioral Health Network for Tobacco and Cancer Control. Um, it's a five-year grant initiative that we're working in collaboration with the CDC and a number of other partners who I'll talk about in a few seconds. Um, so over the next five years, our aim through this network is really to promote, as Lara mentioned, the, o the improvement of the overall health and wellness of um, behavioral health populations. Um, by specifically focusing on eliminating cancer and tobacco related disparities in this population. And ideally, at the, um, at the end of the five years, we'd like to say that we have, um, we have smoke free policies in all behavioral health treatment facilities. Um, big shout out to North Carolina for passing that law last week. Um, we'd also like to say that we see no tobacco use among people with behavioral health conditions, ideally. Um, and also, we'd like to see um, a greater use of peers, as um, Dr. Williams mentioned, um, to help folks with smoking cessation efforts across the nation. Um, and just generally through the network, we really um, will aim to do this through a number of uh, different activities. Um, we'll be utilizing social media a lot to help push out the word about the national network related to this population, as well as a number of trainings, technical assistance, um, as well as uh, a new e-newsletter that we are um, just now disseminating, that we just launched in April. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. 
Um, so as we mentioned before, uh, we are working in collaboration with three partners. We have uh, Dr. Chad Morris and his team from the Behavioral Health and Wellness Program. We're also working with Dr. Stephen Schroeder and his team from uh, SCLC, as well as Dr. Catherine Mathis from the Centerstone Research Institute to really help with our evaluation efforts. And in addition, a huge part of this network is really the call for recruitment, the recruitment of people like you uh, to help participate in this network. It's really not one, two, or three or four organizations that I named, but we're really working in collaboration and coordination with people like you who are doing this work on the ground. And we really want to engage with you, involve you, and also look, at, look to you to showcase and highlight that this work is being done in the field, and we don't want to recreate the wheel. So we really want to encourage all of you, if you have not done so already, I'll provide in a couple of slides later, um, an opportunity for you to join the network and start sharing what you are already doing in the field around addressing cancer and tobacco disparities among the behavioral health population. Um, in addition, um, another big component of this um, that the CDC has asked us to put together is an advisory council. So we're really working with a number of stakeholders from the fields of tobacco, cancer, public health, to really help advise the work that we're doing. We really don't want to work in a silo, and we really want to learn from what other folks are doing and bring that in to help us um, develop our content for our webinars, develop the strategy sessions that we'll be providing, and developing a number of the other activities that we'll be working on through this network. Um, so, I wanted to definitely mention that uh, this work is not just focused on tobacco control and prevention, but another huge piece of this, um, with funding through the Division of Cancer Prevention and Control, is the focus on re uh, reducing or eliminating cancer-related disparities amongst people with behavioral health. And um, as you take a look at these statistics, I just want to tell you a little story, um, a short story that um, one of our uh, integrated health consultants, that's what the National Council shared with you. And it's going to be just brief because I um, have forgotten some of the details. Um, so one of our integrated health consultants um, works in a behavioral health clinic in the Midwest. Um, and she indicated that um, one of her clients that she'd been doing some psychotherapy with um, came into the clinic um, and spoke to another clinician and had mentioned that she had a fire god that was in her throat. Um, initially, because this um, individual is, has, was diagnosed with schizophrenia, you know, the clinician initially uh, dismissed this as something as a part of her psychosis. Um, and then uh, the second visit came along, and the woman indicated again that she had a fire god in her throat. And the clinician looked more carefully and started asking some questions, so they referred this individual out. And this individual got a scan and come to find out this person had a tumor, which was cancerous. And a few months later, this person later passed away. And so I think this is an important story because as you can see um, in these stats, numbers, uh, the second and third stat, individuals with uh, mental health may develop cancer at a, at a rate 2.6 times higher than the general population. And this may be due to certain things as late stage diagnosis and inadequate treatment and screenings. Additionally, individuals with, with mental health have a higher rate of fatality due to cancer, and this is just an example. And as we've been looking at the literature, it's so alarming that we're not finding more information out there related to cancer in the behavioral health population. So through this network, we really aim to contribute to the literature and also work with folks from our advisory council who have a specialized expertise in cancer and behavioral health to really look at these statistics and help reduce this disparity and bring it to the attention of many clinicians and providers and health care professionals across the United States. So, as I mentioned before, um, we really want to look to you all to join the network and really share these types of stories with folks so that we can actually get it on the minds of people that we need to address cancer and tobacco and behavioral health populations. And over the next year, we'll be working with uh, a number of folks from SCLC and the Behavioral Health and Wellness Program to have a number of activities focused on webinars, really focused on um, the tobacco and behavioral health, like a, a high level, what, what do we know about tobacco and behavioral health? Also, we're gonna be um, focusing on how behavioral health treatment facilities can really go tobacco free, learning from other states such as North Carolina and Oklahoma. Um, we also want to look at um, cancer and really figure out how can we contribute to the evidence based around cancer in the behavioral health populations. 
Another activity that we'll be working on is convening multi-state leadership forum um, to learn from states that have implemented tobacco-free policies at the state cancer and tobacco control levels, and really using this information to develop a guide for other states to follow. Um, another thing that we'll be doing is, uh, again, as I mentioned, disseminating a bi-monthly newsletter called the Network Insider, which a few of you have probably already seen, where we'll not only be um, sharing information and resources related to this topic area, but also highlighting the stories um, that are, are being done in this area. And lastly, um, you can follow us. Um, we don't have a separate National Behavioral Health Network Twitter or Facebook page right now because we're still in the development phase, but you can follow us on Twitter at the National Council as well as um, start using the hashtag join the network and you can copy and paste this link to actually join the network and register to become a participant. And lastly, um, I just want to leave you with this final question. I would love your responses to this, do you all have any thoughts on how to prevent and reduce tobacco usage and cancer rates among people with behavioral health conditions? And we'd like to hear from you, what would you like to see out of this new network that the CDC has graciously funded? Thank you.